Okay, so picking up from what we just discussed, which was when we actually, how we determine whether training is needed and an understanding of the context of training. So the organizational's attitudes or culture towards training, the trainee's personal attitudes and individual traits that they bring into the training and the trainer themselves all impact the successfulness of the training. We're going to look at some of those other aspects we just recently talked about at the end of the last set of lectures, and that is the idea of instructional design and the principles of learning. So, instructional design is all activities that are developed and coordinated to support a trainee's learning process. So basically, they are all the elements that we're going to put together to create a training program. So instructional design was basically is focused on the methodology of training what components and elements are going to be used. And an element is the determining of what is to be learned. Learning can be categorized as cognitive, psychomotor, or social. So when we're developing a training program, one of the things we want to ask is, what are we trying to teach? What are the elements? Are we trying to teach cognitive elements? Are we trying to teach people how to process information better? Are we trying to give them information? Are we trying to give them knowledge? Is the training elements mainly focused on psychomotor? Are we trying to teach actual skills, um, basically pattern recognitions, ability to work machinery, basically, again, anything that involves um, uh, physical decision making, physical interaction? Or is it social? Are we trying to teach people how to interact better in groups? Are we trying to teach them social skills? Each one of those is an element. So what types of elements are we trying to learn? And what are the planned evaluations? So what are the specific techniques that we're going to use to train either cognitive, psychomotor, or social skills, and how are we going to evaluate whether we were successful in that training? So the principles of learning. So when we're talking about learning from a psychological viewpoint, it's a permanent, relatively permanent change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience or practice. So the idea of learning is that we're trying to permanently change behavior. So all learning, whether it's psychomotor, whether it's social, or whether it's cognitive, should cause a permanent change. So if it's a cognitive change, we're just trying to give knowledge. What we're looking for as far as a permanent change is that that person has access to that knowledge when they didn't before. If we're talking about psychomotor, that the person now has the ability to um, basically work a calculator when they didn't have that skill before or they are capable of putting together complex parts of a part of a, a manufacturing process that they weren't able to before and if it's social that that person now has the ability to do social interactions in a different way than they did before and that the way that they're learning these changes is through experience or practice so they're being given the opportunity to learn these new skills and they're being given the opportunity to practice and that a part of learning should be that learning and practice. So in a typical college course it's usually more of a cognitive focus. We're trying to give knowledge and information and a part of the practice that's incorporated into that so the experience is actually being given the information. The practice is taking the quizzes, writing the papers, those are basically you're now having to apply that knowledge that you've learned as a way to make sure that it becomes a more permanent change that you now have access to this information. IO psychologists draw on learning research to apply it to training programs. So this is another good example of how IO psychology will draw from all fields of psychology and even outside of psychology. If it is driven by good scientific research, we're going to draw on it to do what we need to do in organizations. So trainees must learn if a program is to be successful. So remember in the definition of training in the last set, we talked about how training included learning, but it also included that learning becoming behaviors and those behaviors affecting organizational goals. Well, if you don't have learning to begin with, then you're not going to get the behavioral change and the rest. So we always want to focus, at least to begin with, on this idea of are we actually teaching and are the students actually learning or the employees. So we're going to talk about some just broad concepts and the principles of learning. Um, and the idea of learning, one thing that we know from research is that active learning is better than passive learning. Um, now, active learning also is more expensive and more time-consuming than passive learning. Passive learning is effectively what's going on right now. You are most likely passively learning. You are listening to me lecture, you're reading these slides, you're being given the information. 
Active learning is when you're participating in a discussion board and you're actually interacting with each other. It's when you're working in a small group. It's when you're given a project. When you're writing your paper, that's active learning. You're having to take the information that you've gotten and apply it. So one of the principles of learning is that the more that we can realistically and efficiently include active learning, the better that learning process is going to be. Now, again, it depends on what you're trying to teach, and not everything can be taught through active learning, but we always want to think about when we design training, how can we incorporate more active learning? Because active learning also usually involves the direct inclusion of practice of the skills, of the knowledge, of the psychomotor skills, of the social skills, than just listening. Um, so anytime you're in any kind of class where they're suddenly, let's break into groups and do an activity, that's the idea of active learning. The next principle of learning we always want to consider when we're doing training is the size of the unit to be learned. Is it something can be do, done in whole or part learning? So for highly organized, coherent, independent tasks, it may be more effective to be trained in the whole task at one time. So if there's a very organized, clearly lumped together, independent task, in other words, we're trying to teach you how to do one thing, that one thing has four or five components, and it can be learned in isolation from any other skill. That's something that should be trained as a whole task. That's whole learning. For a more complex tasks that's easily divided into independent components, you want to train on each component separately. So for instance, earlier in the class, we talked about um, uh, rater error training. The idea of basically teaching people how to identify the most common errors that occur in when you're doing ratings of people's performance. And we talked about distributional errors, severity error, leniency error, similar to me error. And I mentioned that that set of about five or six slides was an example of rater error training. So if all my only purpose was to just train that, that could be trained at one time. That could be one single meeting, one single set of slides. We go through it. We practice it a few times. I give a test. That's a great task to do as a whole task. Now, within this class, though, it was but one component of many other additional things. So that was a part of a lecture set that is looking at all of the impact on performance appraisal. But this class is trying to train you on what industrial and organizational psychology is. And therefore, that's a fairly complex set of knowledge. And I've broken the class up broadly into the I side and the O side. And we're just about ending up on the I side. And we're going to start talking about O side issues in just a few lectures. But I've also broken up each one of those into distinct parts. Um, performance appraisal, selection test, training. So that is an example of part learning. It makes more sense to break it up into independent components, but there's a broader, bigger picture that is being taught. The size of the unit to be learned. So again, depending on how much is being learned, not only do we want to ask ourselves, can we use whole training or partial training? In other words, should we train everything at once, or should we break it up into multiple training sessions? We also want to ask about practice. Um, do we want to use distributed practice or massed practice? So distributed practice is training divided into segments, usually with rest to sec periods in between. So it's better for learning skills and for long-term retention, but not always practical for organizations. Again, to do distributed practice in a training set requires multiple meetings, multiple times. It's time intensive. It's effective also for low complexity tasks, so distributed practice, breaking it up into components, and also practicing it multiple times. Mass practice is training that takes place at one time without break, so we just practice until everyone has it. Um, so distributed practice often involves breaking a component apart, and it's better for learning these skills that have a longer term retention when we have the time and effort to do it, and the resources to do it. Mass practice is generally better for very simplistic skills where you're just trying to get people to understand. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is mass practice often goes more likely and more easily with whole learning. Distributed practice usually goes more with part learning. So another principle of the learning is the meaningfulness of the material. So the more meaningful that you can make the material through your instructional design, the better the class is going to be. So generally speaking, what has been found that overviews of material should be presented. 
So at the start of each one of these lectures on that first slide that includes the information about what readings are due, if there's any assignments, and a little bit of information about how to actually listen to these lectures, I also provide an audio. And usually what that audio is, is kind of an overview of what we've talked about before and what we're going to talk about now. And that's a fairly important part of the principal learning. It's providing information about what we're talking about. You want to present the material in a very easy to understand way using a lot of job relevant examples and you also want to sequence the material in a logical order. Now again, studies have found that if you do the three of these, these three actions alone will increase the effectiveness of training in almost all situations, including overviews and a discussion of why the material is meaningful, presenting the material in a way that's easily understood, including examples, and especially in workplace settings, job relevant examples. Let me tell you how this information directly applies to your specific job. And the sequencing of materials, a logical order, all increase the efficiency or the accuracy or the success of learning. We also want to talk about practice and overlearning, again, within the principles of learning. So I mentioned that there's two types of practice, that we could have massed practice or um, distributed practice. But there's also something called perfect practice. Perfect practice is the idea that just having someone practice something is not good enough. It needs to be actually practiced with feedback to make sure that the practice is actually perfect practice. And this doesn't mean it's perfect and there's nothing wrong with it. It means that corrections are being given as the practice is done. Um, so I've got a picture up there of the U.S. military, and I've actually, this is a fairly well-known um, statement from the actual instructors that do uh, marksmanship training in the U.S. Army. And I've actually talked to a few people to do this, and they've strongly supported this idea that they would much rather have someone that has never held a rifle in their lives to train them on how to shoot, because that allows them to show them exactly the right way to do it and to train them from the ground up. They say that occasionally someone with experience with weapons will be really good to begin with, but even then, a lot of times, they have some habits that make them not as good as they should be, and those are hard to train out because they've already practiced that way over and over and over again, but they didn't practice the right way. I think of this a lot when I watch my son, who's just learning to play the trumpet, and a lot of times he'll start to practice his trumpet, and immediately we realize we can't just let him practice by himself because you'll start to slouch, you'll start to make mistakes, and if someone isn't there correcting him, those mistakes are what he's actually practicing. So perfect practice is the idea that practice on itself, it isn't just good enough to say people, go out and practice. You need to watch the practice and provide feedback to make sure the practice that is being done is actually what is being trained. Finally, when we're talking about practice, we want to be talking about overlearning. So once someone practices something up to the point where they are proficient, we shouldn't stop practicing at that point. Overlearning is the process of giving trainees continued practice even after they appear to master the skill, resulting in a high level of learning. And a good example of overlearning um, is driving a car. Um, once you've actually attained the skills through a driver's education class or maybe a family friend or your parents or someone else trained you to drive a car, when you got to the point where you were comfortable with the rules of the roads in most situations, you aren't, weren't as good then as you are now because you over-practice, you over-learn. You start to make it to where everything about driving a car, shifting, braking, turning on the blinker, becomes second nature. That's the idea of overlearning, practicing to the point where it's not just that you're good at it, you're good at it with little effort. So a major principle of learning, and this feeds back a little bit on the last slide because we were talking about perfect practice, is the idea of feedback or knowledge of results. We often refer to this in IO psychology as KOR, knowledge of results. It's the timely and useful feedback is important. Provide information during practice so adjustments can be made in the behavior. Make the learning process more interesting and increasing the motivation to learn and leads to goal setting for improving feedback. So if when we use feedback, in other words, the trainer talking to the trainee about what they're doing, when we do that, if it's timely and useful, we find out that it provides the ability to uh, allow perfect practice. It does make the learning process more interesting and increases motivation. And also the trainees tend to be able to get easy goals from that feedback to where they can improve performance. So some important principles for delivering this kind of feedback, this knowledge of results, works best when it's immediately following the behavior. So the best kind of feedback is feedback you get right after you make a mistake. 
So if you're practicing something and you do something slightly wrong, that's the best, that's the moment for optimal feedback. It's best when it's immediate and frequent. So again, it should be somewhat frequent, both positive and negative. You're doing really well. That was great. That was great. Oop, you missed that one note. Let's go back and try that again. Both positive and negative feedback have value when delivered in a sensitive yet calm, clear and calm manner. So again, generally speaking, people respond poorly to feedback when it doesn't fit this model. When it's infrequent, when it's often not immediately following the behavior, and especially if it's mainly negative. We're going to see pretty strong uh, reaction and negative reaction to that feedback. If the feedback is immediately following the behavior, so the person knows they just made a mistake and can see that mistake, when the feedback is a part of an, a kind of a frequent feedback, so they're used to getting feedback, and that they're used to getting both positive and negative feedback, all of these help the delivery of feedback. So now that we're, we're kind of leaving the idea of how to teach and now we're moving to the next part of once someone has learned something so they've taken a training class it had the principles of good instructional design they got good feedback and knowledge of results and now we have that next level of the definition of training once someone has learned it we want to see it actually result in behaviors in the workplace with the thought that those behaviors will lead to organizational goals we refer to this as transfer of training. So the term transfer of training refers to that transfer from the successfully learning a new knowledge, skill, ability to the actual use of that knowledge, skill, and ability in the workplace. So it's the extent to which the material, skills, or procedures learned in training are taken back to the job and actually used regularly by the employee. So transfer of training is the idea that the learning hasn't just been learned, it's actually being utilized. And there's two types we look for. Positive tra transfer, the training actually improves performance, and negative transfer, per per performance declines after the training. So again, just whether the skills are being utilized isn't enough. We also want to know, is it positive transfer, i.e. not only did it transfer and result in behaviors, but those behaviors actually improve the performance, that end goal we are looking for. There can be negative transfer. Yes, they learned it. Yes, they're using the behaviors, but the behaviors actually end up hurting performance and declining the performance after the training. And this would be, we've gotten transfer, they learned it and they're using it, but the end result that we're hoping for at the end of that whole series of training, organizational outcomes, has actually been negatively impacted. So how to increase the likelihood of positive transfer of training? One of the things is, is going back to the actual um, instructional design itself. So maximizing the similarity between training situation and job situation. This is often called identical elements theory and the idea is that the training should mirror on the job situations as closely as possible and the more closely it mirrors on the job situations the more likely you're going to see transfer of training. The more abstract the training is, the more it's hard to relate the training to the actual workplace, the less likely you're going to see positive transfer of training. Training that provides an adequate amount of active practice. So once the training is done, instead of immediately just assuming people are going to actually work, bring those behaviors to the workplace, to actually continue training and practicing those behaviors. Providing different contexts in which employees can practice the desired behavior. So again, providing information is a part of the training. Here's areas outside of this training where you can still practice these behaviors, and here's how you, that would look. And finally, trainers, trainees, and managers should work together through the process. This last bullet point is, again, bringing training back into that bigger picture of performance management techniques. Remember, performance management is this idea of not only measuring performance, but actively involving the employees that are being evaluated on their performance into the process, including feedback and actionable goals. An actual goal can be both training and additional practice of that training, and that can be integrated into this idea of the trainers, the trainees, and the managers working together to provide opportunities and support for applying the behaviors learned in the training to the actual job. Additionally, expectations for trainers, trainees, and managers should be clear up front. So before training even is initiated, um, one of the things a industrial organizational psychologist might do is make sure that managers are supportive of the training and are willing to incorporate the practice from the training in kind of their performance management systems.
you want to make sure that the trainers understand what actually their expectations are, including not just the training itself, but any obligations above and beyond the training, monitoring practice and making sure it continues, and also the trainees, trainees development and also the trainees uh, motivations and interest in the training. Um, providing on-the-job maintenance programs to help employees continue the learning behaviors has also been found to be a strong predictor of increasing the likelihood of positive transfer of training. Now again, you can kind of see all of these are kind of perfect world situations. Um, so providing on-the-job maintenance programs, that's going to cost, again, more time and money, especially if you're doing a one-time training program. That's one of the reasons that a lot of those Fortune 500 companies have literally a department of training, which allows people to be working on these kind of additional um, elements of training above and beyond and constantly kind of working on increasing this transfer of training. Also, social support is a big factor. It's important to the transfer process. So a transfer climate is basically that there's peer and supervisory support for that transfer. So if you, for example, took 10 people out of a, a construction line of 100 employees and trained them on a new social technique to basically um, alleviate on-the-job conflicts, but when they went back to the workplace, all of their peers rejected any attempt that they had to basically help them with these issues, and the supervisors weren't providing any support either. In that climate, you're not going to see a transfer. So whenever training occurs, again, we have to ask, is there an overall organizational climate that is going to encourage that transfer of training? Another example for this might be that you're given training as an employee about a new technique and a new procedure that's going to take about an extra hour out of your day every week. But then your supervisors are not willing to give you less work to where you've got that hour to spend. Again, the climate is not going to allow that transfer of climate or transfer of training. Okay. So the rest of the slides in this particular lecture set, we're going to focus just on different ways to deliver training. And I'm going to kind of go through these slides fairly quickly uh, because most of this is just categorization. There's not a whole lot more than just kind of talking about making you aware of the different ways that we can apply all of the principles we've talked about to actually specific methods of training. So we're going to talk about the traditional approaches, more technologically based approaches, and also employee development based approaches. So traditional approaches include the use of simple lecturing to teach trainees important work relevant information. And the lecture is still one of the most used techniques of training and teaching out there, mainly because it allows, it's basically just efficient, it is somewhat useful, it is somewhat successful, it is not the best way to train someone, but it allows one expert to train a large group of people in a shorter period of time. So it's very economical, and you can train many people at once. The effectiveness of the technique varies greatly. It's useful for teaching facts and acquiring knowledge, so it's at its strongest if the point is basically teaching cognitive traits. It's teaching knowledge, on which most college courses are kind of focused on. It's not very effective for developing problem solving or interpersonal skills, so basically just lecturing at someone on how to be more social or how to um, uh, deal with difficult workplace situations. It may have some impact, but a lot of those kind of trains, and especially if you're trying to train specific technical skills require hands-on practice and individual time. So fixed time limit not likely to include practice, doesn't likely include overlearning, and often won't include feedback. So the fact that a lecture, it's hard to provide feedback on someone's performance when all they're doing is listening to a lecture. It rarely includes practice, and it rarely includes overlearning. Um, I strongly always suggest to all students that they read the textbook, they review my lectures and then they either attend my lectures in a live class or listen to my lectures online. The idea behind that is that's you taking control of your own overlearning. You're going to get the information in mo from multiple sources in multiple ways and it is more likely that you will retain that information. Another traditional approach is on-the-job training. It's probably the most widely used training technique in organizations. And the underlying assumption is that a new employee can learn simply by watching an experienced employee talking with the employee, and working with actual job materials. Now, the potential downside is that this type of training has a high reliance on the person doing the training, and the person doing the training rarely is trained as a trainer. They haven't created a structured plan of instruction. They literally are just doing their job and letting someone else shadow them. Um, put in place instead of carefully planned training programs, basically a lot of organizations are using this when they probably should have more carefully planned training programs. 
but it's fairly cheap, it's fairly efficient, and a lot of smaller organizations definitely use this type of training. Self-directed approaches is trainees work at their own pace to uh, remedy identified weaknesses using self-instructional materials. So anytime you've ever downloaded a short lecture, listen, you know, so basically this is, it's pre-programmed instruction. Um, presents material broken into small elements, arrange material from simple to complex, administers a short task after each element, and it gives fairly immediate feedback. So the quizzes you're taking in this class, this class is a little less lecture and a little more self-directed techniques. And that's because you get to choose what materials you're going to use. Um, if you've chosen to listen to these lectures, that's a component that you've decided to listen to. Some students may be actually just looking at the slides and reading the textbook. It's self-directed. And the tests are being done. There are short tests administered after each element, and you get immediate feedback. You're told what the right answer was and what answer you chose. So the problem with this is learning control can be counterproductive. So basically, if you've got a highly motivated learner, this system can work almost as good as any other traditional approach. However, when we talked about the last slide on the job training, that particular type of training is highly dependent on the skill and the knowledge and the training ability of the actual current employee, the incumbent, that is being the person that's training the new incoming employee. So it's very much focused on if you've got a good trainer, it's going to be a good experience. If you've got a bad trainer, or if they're shadowing someone that does their job poorly, it's going to result in very bad training. This particular method is very learner dependent. If you've got someone highly motivated that wants to learn, this is going to work great. If you have someone that needs to be motivated, if you need someone that needs structure, who's likely to start skipping lectures if they're allowed to, this is probably not a very good technique for teaching those people. Another traditional approach is work simulators. So a simulator is designed to be as realistic as possible so trainees can easily transfer skills. So like a flight simulator is a good example of this. Use when actual equipment is too costly and training would be inefficient, i.e. training astronauts, airline pilots, also heavy machinery operators. The determinants of simulator effectancy are basically two factors, physical fidelity and psychological fidelity. So to make a good simulator, it needs to have high fidelity of both physical, the extent to which the operations mimic the real world. So does the actual flight simulator look just like a cockpit? Does the actual driving simulator look just like a car? And psychological fidelity, the extent to which behaviors per uh, behavioral processes needed for success on the job are necess... Uh, now, I am messing this up. I'm going to start over again. Extent to which behavioral processes needed for success on the job are necessary for success in the simulation. That's a really complex way to say that if you are feeling no psychological... Like, let's say you're doing a flight simulator and it's simulating a crash. And at no point do you have experience any anxiety or any um, concern in the simulator. Well, just because you figure out what to do in that situation doesn't mean that that would actually transfer to a real-world situation. So psychological fidelity is why flight simulators often also move, have flashing lights, sirens. It's to increase that anxiety that you would be experiencing if something went wrong in an actual real flight situation. So the more a simulator has both physical fidelity and psychological fidelity, the stronger and more likely it's going to transfer whatever you learn in that simulator to the real world. So some technological approaches, um, audiovisual techniques. So the use of audiovisual and multimedia presentations is the basis of training. Um, so instead of a traditional lecture, this is actually um, connecting a lecture or connecting information to also visuals believed to be at least as effective as and often more effective than traditional live lectures. Now, most live lectures incorporate audiovisual techniques today. Most people giving lectures are also including PowerPoint slides, videos, graphics. It does allow for flexibility in presentation. Um, and again, this is when it's available online or as a video that you can pause, you can repeat, you can stop. And similarly, this particular set of lecture slides is fairly similar to that. It's a technology-based approach. In that, you can stop this lecture whenever you want. You can re-listen to a slide, and you couldn't do that if you were listening to me lecture live in a classroom. Distance learning is simply the delivery of education or training materials through electronic means. So basically, any of the methods we've talked about, with the possible exception of um, uh, direct on-the-job training, can also be done through electronic means.
Um, the benefits, most efficient use of high quality instructors and instruction. So you have someone construct a very high quality class and hopefully are a fairly good instructor. And then they provide all the materials that can be um, viewed or gone through basically anywhere in the world. Um, some of you I know are taking this class are here in Edwardsville, Illinois, United States. In fact, a few of you have stopped in physically during my office hours to talk to me. Some of you are taking them from home where you are on vacation, and a few students are actually taking this class from somewhere else in the world outside of the United States. That's a benefit of a technology-based approach, distance learning. Again, like any time, at this point also, though distance learning also typically goes hand-in-hand -hand with somewhat self-directed techniques. The learners have to assume responsibility for their personal success. Very clear cost savings for organizations. They can create a lecture set. Once the create actual all the parts are created, they now exist and can be reused over and over again with minimal modification. Technology-based approach e-learning, training delivered via the internet, employees at remote sites can sort through, read, and work with the information. Benefits, again, easy to update and change the information, can be done at work or other convenient locations, sharing of information via discussion groups. Little, little empirical research um, has been looked at this, and we are starting to see a lot of research look at the idea of e-learning. Um, but it has been found to be maybe slightly more effective even than class-based learning when done correctly. Now notice that when we talked about self-directed approaches, audio-visual techniques, distance learning and e-learning, a lot of you might be sitting and thinking, wow, this all sounds very similar. But each one of these can be used individually and has been used individually in the past. So self-directed learning doesn't have to be online. You literally can get a a set of course materials physically sent to you. A textbook with activity sheets, with an answer book, and various activities to do to where you never even have to be online and you do it individually. That could still be a self-directed learning technique. Audiovisual techniques can be done as a videotape that you watch individually. It could be presented via e-learning. It could also be presented in a real classroom. Distance learning. Sometimes an online class may also just simply be presented at the university and not throughout the entire world. So each one of these is different components that can be, that often are combined into one training. So this class is self-directed, uses audiovisual techniques, is distance learning, and is based on e-learning. So it has all of those components. So employee development based approaches, we're now going to talk about orienta orientation training and new employee socialization. We're going to talk about just some specific types of training. So a lot of organizations do um, organizational socialization, a process by which an individual acquires the attitudes, behaviors, and knowledge needed to participate as an organizational member. And these kind of trainings are usually set up on kind of competency models. It's often formal orientation meetings, and a lot of organizations do this informally. So a lot of times when you start working at a place, you're never actually given orientation training, but you quickly pick up what the expected behaviors are, what the expected dress codes are, without ever being told formally. When, form, when formal or and informal rules, procedures, and expectations are learned, that's what we're learning in organizational socialization. I've got an example of a running track here because for many years, the company Nike, whenever a higher level manager or um, administrator was brought into that company and they were a new hire, one of the things that happened was they actually went to the original racetrack that the founder of Nike used to run on to start to get an idea of the history and the fact that this company started with a very simple idea of someone running on this track that you are now running on and thinking about having how to design a better type of shoe. That is a good example of an organizational socialization, really trying to communicate the history and the expectations and culture of that organization. Another employee-based approach is coaching. So coaching uh, is a process by which supervisors provide subordinates with advice, information, and current performance discussion. Performance, discuss ideas, goals for improving performance. This really is, again, the idea of matching training with performance management. Um, so the training itself is not particularly one set of training. The training is a series of a subordinate or super, a supervisor providing direct goals and direct information to a subordinate. It can be advice. It can be information about how to improve performance. It can be talking about goals. It's coaching. Managers are coached 
and our coaches. So the idea of if you're having coaching, it should be throughout the organization. Each level should be coaching downwards, basically. Coaching affects the goals, the amount of feedback, and asking others for feedback. So when we find an organization is using this coaching model, we tend to find that more feedback is being delivered, which is a good thing. It usually does affect the goals of the organization. In other words, we see an improvement in productivity and, per and performance. And it also opens up people to asking for more feedback. Executive coaching is a subcategory of this and is typically an external consultant for high-level executives. So in other words, each level of management is coaching those under them, and at the highest level, they're being coached by external consultants. By the way, executive co coaching is probably one of the most lucrative careers an IO psychologist can get into if they can actually get into that career. Um, so p executive coaching is very hot in Fortune 500 companies, and it makes a lot of money. So another kind of employment-based uh, approach is behavioral modeling. It's based on the theory that most social behavior is learned through actually behaving, that we learn how to be social by how we behave. And we learn how to behave by modeling the behaviors of others. Um, so this is a well-suited way of basically trying to train interpersonal skills. Um, so in 1979, Latham and Sari developed nine training modules for managerial interactions with subordinates. And there's a lot of models out there, but most of them kind of look like the one I've put here. This is the Q4 model. And this is actually a model that is used here in St. Louis by a company called Psychological Associates. But there's a lot of models that look very similar to this when we talk about behavioral modeling. Because, it's again, it's about how you actually work basically how you treat others and how you behave in the workplace. And it usually has some kind of factor. Um, usually one dimension is about tasks and one, one structure is about social interaction. So on this particular model, if we go across horizontally, at the far end, at the left, is low regard, and at the high end is high regard. This is how you treat people. This is the social dimension. So low regard basically means you really never think about how other people are going to react. You don't think about their emotions. You really don't care. High regard is you're very aware of other people's emotions and how they're going to react to what's going on in an organization. The vertical axis at the bottom is avoids and at the top is initiates. And this is task behaviors effectively. So are you avoiding tasks or are you initiating tasks? Now, ideally, the model of behavior we want to see almost everyone out in an organization is that red block, Q4, that you're involving, you're assertive, but you're also collaborative. In other words, you're getting tasks done. You're initiating tasks. You're task focused. But you're also taking into account the feelings of others. Each one of these other blocks is something that you might be identified as being, but then the idea is, is let's train you to get to that final quadrant of high initiation, high regard. So, for example, a Q2 leader at the bottom there is cautious, unassertive, and uninvolved. So they avoid tasks, they avoid dele delegation, they avoid conflict, but they also really don't even socially interact with anyone. They're basically a very avoidant manager. Low regard, high initiative, which is Q1, that's a very task-focused person that doesn't care much about others. So that's kind of a dictatorial, very insensitive, very domineering. And finally, Q3, great person to be around. They're easygoing, they're overly friendly, they're talkative, they treat people fairly, but they're not actually getting the tasks done. So behavioral-based modeling is, again, a specific type of training that we often see in organizations that identifies where each employee is on this kind of a grid. And it may not be using these exact terms, but this kind of grid training is very popular in organizational training and behavioral modeling. And then provides specific goals of how the person can move from whatever box they're in up to that red box in this particular model, the Q4. So employee development-based approaches also includes the idea of entire corporate universities. So the idea of actually creating a part of the company that isn't just a training and development, but there's actually a literal school that people can be sent to. Corporate classrooms, modern facilities with up-to-date technology, and allowing for effective learning and transfer on site. Um, examples of companies that use corporate universities are General Electric, Motorola, McDonald's Hamburgers University, Caterpillar Training Institute. I actually, so I've known people that have gone to McDonald's Hamburger University. And I have friends that are actually instructors at Caterpillar's Training Institute, IO psychologists. And this stems from that societal trend, a kind of a third wave um, of people coming into organizations in which the world's industrialized economies are now kind of evolving into knowledge-based societies. So a lot of organizations are starting to realize that their biggest resource is no longer physical wealth, 
It's actually the wealth of knowledge and skills in their employees, their re human resources. And that if they actively invest money into increasing those human resources, that will result in, pro in, an out in positive outcomes.